I do. All right, so, we are going to get started. Thank you all so much for being here with us tonight. I'm Lauren McCormick, the Executive Director of the Burns Museum of Art here at the Science College. Excited to welcome you to the Burning for tonight's program. Believe it or not, all together, I believe we have about 100 people in the audience tonight uh, here in person and on the phone. So thank you all so much for being with us this evening. We are thrilled to have five outstanding photographers with us. Don Camp, Stephen Kerloff, Ron Harbour, Wendell White, and Lynn Williams. It's a privilege to bring them all together with us to talk about their work, particularly in the context of world exhibition, a stirring song sung to Rowan, African American, from slavery to freedom, 1619 to 1865. The exhibition in tonight's program will be possible with the generous support of the Pennsylvania Council on Life. And now I'd like to welcome our creative director, Dr. Deborah Barton, coordinator of tonight's program and curator of a certain song from Heroic, to introduce our speakers. Thank you for joining us at tonight's event. And I'm honored to introduce this evening's guests in the order that they will be speaking. William Earl Williams is the Audrey A. and John L. Rousseau Professor in Humanities. Professor of Fine Arts and Curator of Photography at Haverford College. His photographs have been widely exhibited in group and solo exhibitions at the Cleveland Museum of Art, George Eastman House, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the National Gallery, Smith College, and the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University. Donald E. Camp is Professor Emeritus here at Earth Science College. His photography is featured in museum collections and exhibitions regionally and nationally, including the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Pennsylvania Museum Academy of Fine Arts, and the Delaware Art Museum. He is the recipient of an Individual Artist Fellowship by the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, as well as fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. Wendell White, who will be joining us on Zoom, is a distinguished professor of art and American studies at Stockton University. His awards include a Robert Gardner Fellowship in Photography from the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnography at Harvard University, three artist fellowships from the New Jersey Council for the Arts, a Bunn Lectureship in Photography, and grants from Center in Santa Fe, and the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, as well as numerous artist residencies. Ron Tarver is Associate Professor of Art at Swarthmore College. Before joining the faculty at Swarthmore, he served for 32 years as a staff photojournalist at the Philadelphia Inquirer, where he shares a 2012 Pulitzer Prize for his work on a series documenting school violence in the Philadelphia public school system. He is co-author of the book, We Were There, Voices of African American Veterans, which was accompanied by a traveling exhibition that debuted at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. Stephen Perloff is the founder and editor of The Photo Review, a critical journal of international scope and editor of The Photograph Collector, the leading source of information on the photography art market. He is the recipient of two grants from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts for Art Criticism. His photographs have appeared in numerous exhibitions and reside in museum and private collections, including the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the George Eastman Museum. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speakers. Uh, each one of us is uh, given five minutes to give an overview of our work. And what I would want to do is this. So I'm going to be talking about the 54th Massachusetts Monument, a study in memory collecting and photography from 1974 to 2015. Uh, that's a long way of saying I'm going to tell you about um, how I research an image, how I think about it, and how the photograph is made. Unfortunately, um, the image that I'm going to talk about tonight was originally scheduled to be in this show, but I got sick when we were planning for it, so it didn't make it because of the logistics of doing a show like this uh, with a museum. So it didn't make it, so I thought I would add this 
picture tonight and talk about it. And really, uh, I got interested in the 54th Massachusetts Monument when uh, I lived in Boston and I walked by it every day on my way to the Boston Public Library Central Branch in Copley Square. So I lived on the backside of Beacon Hill and I walked by this every day. And at some point, uh, I got a copy of Lay This Floral. And what's uh, provocative about Lay This Floral is, as you can see the monument there, it's encrusted and it's uh, really not in very good shape. And that has a lot to do with the fact that it was quite old. And Latest Laurel was published in 1973. And this is the full title of the book, is Latest Laurel, an album on the St. John's Memorial on Boston Common, honoring black and white men together who served with the Union cause with Robert Gould Shaw and died with him July 18, 1863. And the book is co-authored by Lincoln Kirstein and Richard Benson, which is a, a break uh, in that a photographer is given credit for doing a book and, in fact, takes the lead over the person who does the writing. And the book is beautifully reproduced. And it gives a lot of information about it. Now, in 19... 97, the 100th anniversary of the monument. Uh, the Aikens Press published this book with a limited edition. And you can see the monument is quite clean now, before the um, very first image. See, it's all encrusted and now it's cleaned up. Part of that also had to do with originally when the monument was dedicated in 1897, it did not include the black soldiers, the rank and file who fell at Fort Wagoner. It did include the five white officers who were killed there. And those were on the back of the monument. So we always look at, historically, we look at how the meaning of artwork changes or how it's interpreted. And this is um, an image that was published at the time of the dedication of the memorial in 1897. And what's interesting about this is this is at the bottom of it. It says, with a career, copyright 1897, Augustus St. Gaudens, photo gravure from a copy print, copyright 1897, Curtis and Cameron. Curtis and Cameron were the publishers. Augustus St. Gaudens was the um, sculptor and he's the one that commissioned photograph yes and so two minutes very good and so this led me to look for this image which is very different than the gravure it's really the way that saint gons imagined that his work would be seen and this is uh, 2013, when I was invited to be part of the uh, show at the National Gallery, the title of the show was called uh, Tell It With Pride. And you can see my photographs are on the right there, and they're in conversation with the plaster, which is the original for the cast. And um, that got me to thinking a couple things about how to photograph the memorial. And this is, uh, after all of that, thinking about, well, now the black soldiers are on the back of the memorial. And what is the memorial? It's really um, the whole pedestal, the whole architecture that Charles McKim had designed for it. And so um, what I decided to do was make this picture not having to show the front because it's about the memorial and uh, if you look carefully you'll see the pictures divided into fifths and if you look around the gallery you'll see the, uh, the architecture for the photographs is uh, within a square 
uh, the square is solidified by the geometry, the internal geometry. And part of that has to do with looking at Joseph Albert's square. And so that's some of the formal direction, that's some of the history of making one photograph, which as I said, would have been here <clears throat> had I not gotten sick. And that's it. That's what I can tell you. So I think we pass it over to Don. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Willie. <laughs> Professor Lee. <Wayne. laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's so pleasant to be here and uh, look at this work that he's done. It's phenomenal. They're photographed beautifully and they're printed beautifully, presented beautifully. So I'm really honored to be a part of what, you, what you've accomplished. Um, be silent. <laughs> Photographs have always had a strong influence on my entire life. Newspapers, magazines, billboards, cinema, television, books, wherever images have been produced or by camera, wherever they may appear, has affected my life. In my very early childhood, I found myself searching local newspapers for images of children, men, and people who look like me. And in the 1940s and 50s, the only images I found of people who look like me, or the ones for public consumption, were images of crime, ineptitude, mocking comedy. Daily newspapers, for example, in most of America, the black community existed in what I term photographs by omission. Photographs where there's a void, there's a void where images exist, but the presence of black existence is absent. Photographs by omission. This first photograph of Emmett Till, America, 1955, as a teenager, I worked in my father's barbershop where I sold newspapers, magazines from the black, from the black press, and printed news for the black American community. In 1955, I saw this photograph and it changed my life. I sold that magazine. I heard the discussion in my father's barbershop and sometimes arguments because some of the men in the barbershop said the Emmett Till, the boy should have known better. Some said enough is enough. And I believe that the lynching, the murder of Emmett Till was the catalyst for the civil rights movement. This is brother who taught me to dance, Ira Camp Jr because I'm one of seven children, I six brothers and one sister. And being the youngest of seven siblings, I was taught facts of life by all of them. One brother taught me to ride a bicycle. You know, it's difficult to learn to ride a bicycle, but once you learn, you never forget how to ride a bicycle. There was another brother who became a professional visual artist. He taught me how to see. Another was a professional musician who taught me how to sing. The things they taught me became metaphors for lessons in my life. Now, this one is of Mr. Ira G. Camp, brother who taught me to dance. Now, he didn't really teach me how to dance. The brother who taught me to sing didn't really teach me how to sing. But they did teach me how to have joy in my life despite all of the difficulties that can surround one. They taught me how to dance and sing in my heart. And I thank them for teaching me how to create my first suite of work, Sons of My Father. And that suite, including my brother, eventually became the most influential part of the body of work titled Dust Shaped Hearts. Rufus Harley, man who hears, man who hears music. Mr. Rufus Harley was a jazz musician who played saxophone, 
but more important was his groundbreaking playing of bagpipes as his major instrument. He came with me to see an early exhibition of my work that included this piece of work, which was, by the way, was at uh, Swarthmore College. When he saw this work, he cried. As he wiped away a tear, he told me that no one had ever made him feel this way about himself. Judge Leon Higginbottom, man who writes. I had an assignment to photograph Judge Higginbottom for Ebony Magazine. The kindness that he shared with me during that job and a personal meeting afterwards led me to want to include him in my work. He was a very gentle and humble man. As he explained how he, view, how he viewed defendants in his court, I thought of the words in a prayer that I know. Know you not why we, exist, why we created you all from the same dust, that no one should exalt himself over the other. So his conversation with me and the words from that prayer confirmed to me that I could and should continue using earth pigment or dust as the foundation for my work. Because metaphors are important to me. My choice of materials that I use to create an image are meaningful. The photo printing at the, of the time uh, uses a silver as a foundation. Silver to me is a metaphor of material wealth. But dust, dust is common. Dust is everywhere. But dust is also fragile, very, very fragile. This one, John Lewis, Good Trouble. I never sought to photograph celebrities or famous people. I didn't want to photograph Congressman John Lewis because he was famous. I wanted to photograph John Lewis because he was always John Lewis. So my body of work, Dust Shaped Hearts, is meant to share images of angels. If angels could walk the earth, the earth would if angels walked the earth, they would be like dust. They would be fragile, but their presence would influence our hearts. So my work is an attempt to honor everyday angels. Thank you. Um... One of the things I'm just going to say in one second is that uh, to, that I have a slightly unstable um, internet connection, so forgive me. I'm going to um, turn my uh, video connection off and uh, just now switch over to my presentation. So in the... Um, years that I have been making photographs for several decades in the African-American community, I wanted to make a connection between the way in which pro work that I did early on has folded out into other projects, has unfolded in ways that has connected my work to a variety of different projects. And I'm just gonna move through so that you get a chance to see um, a sense of the um, the formatting of this work, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about was the degree to which, from the very beginning, all of these projects have both have walked a line to some extent between um, a tremendous amount of uh, pain that has existed within the Black community, and at the same time, a tremendous amount of pride and agency within the black community and a sense of empowerment and thinking about how those two things uh, occupy this, a, a singular space at the same time and the way in which that occupying that space is critical. One of the other things that has come up in that conversation between those two areas has certainly been uh, the way the role of education and um, this is could be a pretty lengthy conversation about 
the role that education has played uh, within the black community and the complexity of it that has taken place both during segregation and after segregation and the ways in which that has impacted um, black intellectual development, black intellectual thought uh, throughout the years. This is a um, one of many um, segregated schools throughout Southern New Jersey and it became later the inspiration for a project on um, segregated schools throughout the United States. And so then I begin changing the format and throughout all of these, there's a continual evolution of format, thinking about landscape, thinking about people. At this point, I've pretty much uh, left the idea of faces behind and I'm looking much more at the archival traces um, of black life in the landscape and in the archive. This is New Jersey um, and this is another uh, school in New Jersey, Bordentown School, and then um, and separating that space from other spaces. One of the things I thought about today was the degree to which the work that um, Maybe you'll unfreeze. In the beginning of the 20th century with the uh, beginning of the First World War, and um, hopefully that didn't stop, uh, with the beginning of the First World War, and then the, the series of violent attacks against the Black community all throughout the United States, and hopefully the way in which the um, different uh, modes of work have interacted with each other, the use of text coming and going that uh, um, has been an important part and the transformation of narrative text, which I created to then using the newspaper itself to talk about the perceptions of uh, the situations that were unfolding across the American landscape. And finally, the images that I began making um, in about 2008 or so of in archives around the country, I actually had set out to work on a landscape project and I began with these images. And once again, the relationship between um, a sense of um, agency and a sense of pain becomes a critical aspect of the photographs and the objects that I encountered in different uh, locations. And in fact, right now, I'm, I'm joining and I was unable to join in person because I was work, I'm working on this very project today. I was in the North Carolina um, State Historical Museum all day photographing um, objects in their collection. And this last image is a uh, image of uh, hair, Frederick Douglass's hair. And this is the image, one of the first images that I made in 2008, which spurred the whole project because it just uh, struck me so powerfully to be able to encounter a part of Frederick Douglass's body in the archive. This is at the University of Rochester in the Rush Rees Library that I felt like I had to continue to pursue the presence and the ghosts of black life in the archives. Uh, around the country, which is what I'm doing at this very minute. Thank you. Okay. So left goes advanced. Is it right? Oh, there no, right, right. right. You got to go right, man. Yeah. I'm dyslexic. <laughs> so right, right goes that yeah, way. Yeah, you're okay. So oh, forward it. Oops. There's window. Did I think Wendell? <laughs> okay. Oh, God. So we have to get out of this before I can do anything. So there you are. There, there, we, there you are. Okay. There you All are. right. So I want to say I'm really honored to be with these gentlemen here and Wendell, wherever you are, and then either out there. But um, 
Yeah, it's, it, I'm so honored to be here and to see Willie's work. It's just, so, it's amazing. Um, so I, I am working on a project now on black cowboys that I started in 1993. And uh, I've done, that's not all, I've been doing other stuff. But it's been a 30 year project. Um, and I, and it's, it's really hard to pull out, you know, two images to, to show you. But I'm going to show you projects, uh, two images from this project, two images from the project I'm working on now with my father's work. Um, but I wanted to show this image um, that was taken in Philadelphia. And so just so you a little, little bit of the background about the Black Cowboy Project. I started this for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, oops, did I do that? Yeah, I guess I did. Um, I started this for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, so, I don't know. Anyway, well, so you saw Jordan there. It's a little boy. This is Jordan taken two weeks ago. So he's, he's 40 now. And, um, and that's his daughter. Uh, the picture before that was, was, was Jordan and, and his, his father, who actually died of COVID um, last year, sadly. Um, but um, um, at the beginning of COVID, I started um, when we all went virtual. I was stuck at home uh, looking at a computer and decided I, I would go back and try to look through uh, all these cowboy images. And I, I did the, uh, the, uh, the, the project, started it with the Inquirer, uh, National Geographic picked it up. I worked on Geographic for like four or five years and um, created about 10,000 slides. Uh, this is all transparency days before digital. And I just had Tupperware, Tupperware boxes full of transparency. So I started editing through. Uh, contacted a friend of mine who was an editor at Geographic and said, can you help me edit this? And so we're down to like 200 slides now. We're going to do a book. We have an agent. We're out shopping the book around. And uh, when I just purely by chance ran into Jordan on Facebook and I said, you know, I went out to, he's a trainer now at the Parks Raceway. And uh, I went out and photographed him out there. And I said, you know, this, there's, there's, there's more depth to this book. So now I'm looking at connecting with some of the people that were, that I photographed 30 years ago. You know, these, like Jordan's 40 now. He was 10 when I photographed him. And a lot of the folks have passed on. I want to go back and look at their families, look at their ranches, see where all those things were. This project was all over the country. It was in Texas, California, Illinois, Oklahoma, in the South. It was just all over the place. So my project now is to go back and, and to shoot this summer, hopefully, if, if the oil prices don't go up and then, you know, <laughs> all that, um, to go back and, and uh, shoot the summer. And I've already made connections with folks in Texas and places to go back and do that. So that's kind of the tra trajectory of that project. Um, and uh, there we go. And so this is one I made in, in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia. This is in the collection of the Studio Museum in Harlem. And I think the Philadelphia Museum bought this one too. So. Um, so this is the other project I'm working on too. Now, um, this is my dad was a photographer, this, which is how I got into photography um, in the 40s and 50s. And he left me this amazing archive of images of the town I grew up in. And um, I started this project because um, I wanted to make a connection between the times that he was photographing in the 40s and 50s in Oklahoma, which was Jim Crow, um, and now. And so how do you do that? How do, you, how do I take those images that, that he made and sort of move them forward and speak about the times we're in now, which is sort of the new Jim Crow? So uh, it, it, this is probably the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. This is basically a studio project. I'm a field photographer, I'm a photojournalist, but I'm sort of thinking about it in two different ways from a photojournalism uh, point of view and from a fine art point of view and from a historical point of view. So it's all those things. And when you're in this head, it gets really confusing sometimes. So, but I, it takes a long time to think, think through these things and think about it. So what this image is, is uh, I wanted to make a comment on, um, on the brown bag test where back in the 40s and 50s where you, you know, you had to have uh, the brown bag test um, Basically, if you were if you had a skin color lighter than a brown bag, you had a certain elevated stance position in society, both black and white. It sort of worked on both sides of the spectrum in, in that regard. But uh, 
<laughs> I wanted to use that. And I had found this woman who later on I found out she was my aunt, and I didn't want to know that, but my cousin told me that, because I'm trying to keep all these images separate, but she kind of let me know who it was. Um, so that's my aunt's sister, my aunt Juanita. We called her aunt's sister. But uh, I took her image and I burned her into, burned her image using a laser cutter into this brown bag. Now you really can't see it there. And all these images are physical. You really have to sort of see them. They don't necessarily photograph well. But I wanted to have that sort of that uh, violent act of actually burning into the paper. I could have silk screened over it or, you know, used some other method to put the image up, but I wanted her to be a part of the paper. So if you see this image, you actually see the burn marks in the paper. So, and uh, everything in, this, in, in, in the images I've made so far are framed in vintage frames. I did have them framed very contemporary in a in contemporary way with black frames, and they just didn't look right. So I, I actually went to the uh, thrift store near my house and uh, just found all these frames, and, and, and it worked. So, so that's the way they're all framed. And I think there's one more here, there. So. Uh, this image, I found this image of these, of these, uh, this, this, actually, this image is about four feet long. It's a pretty good size image. Uh, I found these people and they look like settlers to me. I mean, if you saw the, the, I, you know, in the longer presentation, I show the actual image. They look like settlers from the Dust Bowl. And, uh, so I thought, how can I, how can I, uh, uh get the, I, what can I do with these folks, you know? And so I thought, sort of think about the Dust Bowl. I thought, sort of think about the Great Migration. I thought of thinking about Trump. I thought of thinking about I want to just leave this planet and created this whole backdrop of that created a story around them. So I built this set in my studio. So this set is like about the length of this table, actually. And there, there's 500 pieces of, uh, of uh, paper there that looks like, uh, it looks like a moonscape, but actually it's scanned from the inside of a shell. And I photographed them, pulled some images off the, off the, uh, internet and built the set and then photographed it. And the whole, with the whole idea of, you know, they've, they've left the planet for, for a whole host of reasons. It could be environmental, it could be, uh, you know, social injustice, it could be, but they left, they're gone. And they landed on this planet. At one time, that whole, the surface was smooth. And we had a big rain that flooded my studio. And I walked in the next day and the papers had all curled up. And I thought, okay, there's like two weeks just down the drain. <laughs> and, uh, but then I started thinking, you know, but they'd add sort of this turbulence to it. So even though they've landed on this other planet, they're not necessarily safe. So, you know, it sort of, sort of plays with that idea. And I was, I was reading Parable of the Sower during this time. And, and it just, it just sort of fit, you know, the paper, the, the, so I left it, I left it like that. So um, those are my projects. Thank you. Now we'll start a discussion. And if you have questions, raise your hand. But I'll, I'll start with a question, which is for each of the photographers, who influenced you in your work and who were your mentors when you began? You want to go down the same order, Billy? I think we could start with Willie. I think we okay, should start we... with Willie because you are impressive. I don't know anybody. Start with <laughs> <laughs> It makes my story even more humble. So. Oh, God. <laughs> go ahead. Well, first of all, I, I could say that everybody at this table has, has made an impression on me. Uh, has been important to my work. Now, uh, this is my contemporaries. In terms of historical figures, obviously, I spent 40 years uh, with Augustus St. Gons in the 54th Massachusetts Monument. So, um, <clears throat> I can quite tell you about that uh, search was it was about matching up St. Gaudens' vision of how he saw the troops marching. And that's the only Civil War sculpture where they're black and white people together. And they are, uh, as uh, Lincoln Kirstein 
uh, told the truth in 1963. They were all together and they were all for one cause. And <clears throat> that uh, thinking about that has been very important. Now, in terms of uh, iconography, uh, obviously American uh, vernacular is important. So one of my uh, important uh, people that I look at for inspiration in American vernacular, American subject matter, has been Walker Evans. Um, he and Robert Frank were very important, particularly in their books. So I look at them, and I, I, I did mention Joseph Albers. Um, Albers is important because when I was, I think when I was 22 or so, I discovered the square as a way of working. If you read Cartier-Bresson's The Decisive Moment, he says, well, the square is, is dead. And uh, he's wrong. Um, but uh, that's the thinking of a lot of visual artists, is that the working with the square is very difficult to work with because it equalizes everything. So uh, I say Albers, Evans, my colleagues here, um, and it's been my pleasure as a curator to collect all of them for Haverford. So uh, obviously I can, I can say that without any BS about it. <laughs> That'd be very important. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think likewise, uh, the four of us on this panel, uh, we really respect and learn from each other. Um, and as far as the square goes, I think it's quite a beautiful constant because if it's dead, that means anything I place in it can become alive. So, <laughs> but uh, my, I began very early looking at the works of W. Eugene Smith. Um, and later on, I fell in love with Robert Frank, and, you know, as uh, Willie mentioned, and Roy de Carava. <laughs> Uh, Roy de Carava was the first African American photographer to win a Guggenheim, which he got in, when was it, 1954? 52. I just looked it up to be correct. 52. Okay, yeah. Okay, and mine was 1955. Uh, yeah, 1990. <laughs> yeah. 1990. <laughs> Something like that. I knew you were older than you were. <laughs> well, you're looking pretty good. 95. Anyway, um, I saw there both of their photographs and a uh, book called Camera, a magazine called Camera, while I was in Paris. And uh, Robert Frank's photographs, they, they, they just were so direct. Uh, looked like they were shot from the hip, you know. That's it. Let me take that picture, you know. And while he's talking over here, he's taking pictures over here. But somehow those compositions just pulled themselves together. They were beautiful, uh, energetic. And Roy de Carava had this softness, this beautiful, Beautiful, soft, glowing touch. And they just really, really uh, influenced the way I began to think about the photo photographs. But it was Will Larson, who I'd later studied with at Tyler School of Art, that his use, his, his uh, kind of use of text uh, began to sway me as to being able to use uh, and pay attention to uh, what I had been interested in all my life, and that's those newspaper, those published images that uh, for public consumption that change and or create and change the way we think about things. Um, so those were all very important. Um, I, I would just echo everything that has been said here, but I'd like to add to that the importance of the way in which I've intersected with each of these artists through um, a professional organization that became very much part of my life, which was Society of Photographic Education, and and actually it's SPE where I meet almost where I meet everyone here, and um, Don and, and Willie and Ron as well are all people that have been <clears throat> and and Stephen <laughs> are all people that have um, been connected to me through that. And I think that my, you know, interest in that has been an important part of overlapping my interest as an educator, as well as my interest as an artist and merging those two things together and the role and the way in which that merger takes place. 
<coughs> excuse me, um, and um, I would only add, in terms of thinking about work, would be to add the importance of um, um, sweet fly paper, the use of image and text, as well as the work of Wright Morris and other people combining the image and text together in that space that's partly documentary, partly fine art with a kind of a foot in, in both worlds. Sorry. For those, for those who don't know, Sweet Fly Paper of Life is a classic book yeah. by Roy D. Carava. And, and Langston, and Langston, and Langston, Langston Hughes. Hughes. Actually, I, I got Cliff Edom, who started the Missouri School of Journalism, or who taught there, and now there's a school that's named after him, I guess, in, in Missouri, um, gave me that book. He hmm. gave me the original book that was signed by. Wow. And, uh, and then when Cliff died, his, his mother, or I'm sorry, his, um, his daughter called me hmm. up and asked me if, if I could give it back because they were going to start a library for him. <laughs> So, so someplace out in Missouri, I have my name is on a plate in the book. <laughs> I'd rather have the book, but <laughs> but yeah, that book was such such an influence. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll quickly tell you a sad story. In the '70s, I went to a camera show, and they there were a few people with images and a few people with books, and someone had the sweet white paper. I liked the original, and I pick it up, and I'm looking at it and it was, I'm going to buy it no matter what because it was a very reasonable price. I'm turning the pages and there's a page missing. And I show the guy and I said, there's a pay, page missing. He looks at it and he said, well, it's worthless, take it. <laughs> wow. So I have a copy with one page missing wow. or the two pages. Well, I have to tell you my story about Mini, mini Mata. Okay. Anyway, that's the whole thing. But um, so, yeah, you stole all my thunder about uh, W. Gene Smith and Rody Carrara and those were especially W. Gene Smith. So I'll just start. So when I uh, went to college, I went to a very small college in, in Oklahoma. And I my dad really played a big influence in my photography, even though I never saw him actually take a picture. But he showed me his dark room and I remember going into his dark room and he said, if you put a piece of paper in the developer, he said, a ghost, you're going to see a ghost fly, 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 you know, come out of the water. And so I'm expecting to see Casper, you know. <laughs> and, but when I saw that, hip, that paper develop, I still get chills now, even to this day, you know, 15 years later now. Just a long time. <laughs> I still get chills looking at that paper and thinking about how that, and when I teach my classes and we do, you know, I teach analog class in the fall, and I tell my students, you know, this is, it's going to be, you're going to see magic happen. And I think that most of them get it because it's, you know, if you've been in the dark room, you see that happen. But so I would say my dad sort of on the, you know, the outside of things was my big influence. And then once I got into college, um, I just told my professors that I'm not good really for anything else but taking pictures. And I kind of went through school and uh, literally, literally had to beg my way through a couple of classes. Don't, don't, if any students out there don't listen to me. But, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, so that's why I got through college. Um, and actually, I went out to do a talk at, 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 at the school. They had a journalism day. And so I went out to do a talk. And, and the, the professor that I, that I did get on my knees and beg for a C because I needed it, <laughs> he mentioned that to like 500 kids out there, you know. So, um, yeah, so that's the sad story of my life. But, but I was just, I just wanted to take pictures. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to save the world through my photography. I wanted my pictures to have a social conscious yeah. to them. That's what I wanted to do. And, uh, and I've, luckily I've been able to do that for the most part. And then one other, I have to shout out one other person if she's out there on Zoom someplace, Mary uh, Urick, who was the first real photographer I worked with at the, this little tiny paper called the Muskogee Phoenix. Um, taught me everything about composition, about how you light, and she didn't tell me anything. <laughs> I just watched how she did stuff. It was, she was just amazing. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of my background is wherever that's working. So. Whenever I think of when I hear the word Muscovy, I think of superb barbecue. <laughs> yeah, and good chili yeah. too. Yeah, I mean that's like road trip. Road trip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ron just sort of said it was always photography. How about for the rest of you? you know, how did photography become the medium of expression? Well, Don, why don't you? You know, it. I showed earlier, I talked about my family and then me being the youngest one, but they were also all artists. And I was eight years younger than the one next to me. <clears throat> And so I had this, this, this family of people who played instruments and they drew and they took photographs and it was just the environment that I was in. I knew nothing else. Even my mother, my mother was a singer. She led the church choir, but she also gave uh, uh, concerts in other areas of the place with gospel music and opera. Um, so that's the family that I was in. Um, the oh, I also found this um, sort of box camera. It was a Pansco or a Kodak, no square box camera. Mm. I don't think it worked. Even if it had, a, there was no film being made for it. I have no <laughs> idea how this. And I remember being eight or, eight or nine years old, and I'd get that camera, and I'd run around, and I would click. And I would remember what was in the viewfinder. And that was my way of taking photographs at first. And so it just kind of grew into me. It, and uh, at some point later on, um, I actually was able to enter a dark room when I went into the service. And I thought it was easy. And the first print that I made was garbage. And I tried another one, and it was garbage. And I tried another one, and another one, and I'm still trying to make the print. <laughs> Okay, so, yeah, I mean, that's how it trapped me. That's, you know, each photograph that I turn up, it, it, there's a thing in my head that says, this is going to go this way. And I try to get out of the way. I've learned to get out of the way now, let the print go where it wants to go, so that I have this conversation with it now. But every now and then I get in the way and I'm really unhappy. And every now and then it gets its way. And it's like, well, okay, then go ahead and be what you want to be. Uh, you know, that's kind of the way it is with, with art, with my art. Um, so it's really unique being watching his work because they're so beautiful in a very different way from mm -hmm. mine. Mine are you know, textures and splashes. And, you know, <laughs> the Immatil piece, I let it sit out in the sun so they can bake and bubble up. Uh, you know, I depend on that kind of action of light. Um, but for me, that's, that's photography for me. How about you, Wendell? How do you come to yeah. photography? Yeah, I have a very specific origin story in that I had a high school art teacher by the name of Vernon Maxim, primarily a ceramicist, who sat me down. Um, I, was in, I was sort of poking around the dark room that we had in high school, and he sat me down in front of a 16 millimeter projector and ran the documentary film about Dorothea Lang and um, turned me turned over to me a four by five camera and access to the dark room and <laughs> much you know that that was the end of that and um, my family was always very kind and um, you know sort of personally supportive but had no idea how this was going to possibly ever work out. And so they um, only only when I got my first academic um, position did they start <laughs> to think that this <laughs> might be OK. Um, but, you know, and it was yeah. difficult. The difficulty was that they, you know, came from professional backgrounds in many cases, you know, teachers, ministers, but really didn't, you know, the, they didn't really have a background in the arts. And so the sense was, well, we're just not sure how, how to help you um, because, you know, we don't have that 
that network. And there was a sense that, you know, pretty much all black accomplishment happened through networks. And so uh, I think that was the worry in the, uh, of it at the time. I have to share with you the, the family response. Uh, when I got an academic position, my family was very disappointed. It's like, why are you doing that? Why don't you become a real artist? Right. Right. <laughs> right. right. My mom just wanted me to type. She said, if you learn how to type, you'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> she was kind of right, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's my turn. It is. My origin story in photography is that when I was a fourth grader, I got a Kodak Brownie camera for Christmas. Mm. And I, you know, it's really funny people talk about how they got started. But I think that I saw that advertisement for Kodak on television, and I wanted one. And so I got one for Christmas. And I immediately started photographing everything. One of my favorite things to photograph with, the, with that Kodak Brownie was when you had to have a flash. Mm. I love smelling flash bulb. Mm. That was yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. And I also, uh, the, other, the other part of this was uh, this relationship that I, I have with my grandfather <coughs> is that we would go to the drugstore every Sunday. The, the film that I had exposed, we would give to the drugstore people, and then we would pick up what I had shot the week before. And... Um, that was a that was a ritual. So I was shooting a roll a week of mm. this film, and and my grandfather was he, he 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 thought it was interesting that I was doing that, and so he supported that. And then it's a funny thing, but he he supported a lot of of uh, my photography things. When I can remember that I wanted to get a rolly flash. This is when I was in college. A Rolly Flash at that time cost two hundred dollars, and it was the first one of the ones where you had a, a rechargeable right. battery, yeah. and it was like you could hold it in your hand. It was, it was, yeah. it was out there, man. It like it would tell you, it like bright. it would make a yeah, it would make the right exposure for you and all this stuff because it's an electric eye, and it was German, so it had a really good feel. But he helped me buy that thing. He loaned me some of the money. Actually, he didn't loan it to me gave me the money so that I would have enough to buy that. So that was very important. And I think when I was uh, later on, when I was a foreign exchange student, I was an AFS student in Germany, uh, people there, they had a camera. And I, I borrowed the camera and I used it till I broke it. It, just, it was an old camera and it fell apart. So I take these, these pictures and get them developed and then they would be like, a, kind of, you're in the AFS program, you're supposed to send stuff back so that your sponsor and your family can see what you're doing. So I would send those pictures back and, you know, that was a cool thing that I did that. And then um, I think when I got to college, I had a little bit of a story like Ron and that I took a photography course because I thought it would be a gut course, it would be easy. Because all you did was take pictures. And, <laughs> why not? <laughs> so I took this photography course, and uh, it was uh, it was really interesting. And so all the things from the past they all came back. I was in the dark room and making photographs, and it was a very social thing. You could photograph your friends, and I did all, all that kind of stuff. And so really was um, that kind of. Uh, that kind of background, just the, the joy of having the, uh, the brownie was in a yellow box Kodak, mm -hmm. and it had a silver pattern on the inside. And the camera was fit into that little thing. So yeah, I, it's too bad I threw that away. I have one of those. It. But, uh, but yeah, just, the, just holding that thing and looking through it was magical, yeah.
You'd be surprised at the number of photographers who started out with a brownie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Say, my first camera I got when I was eight years old, it was a box camera like a brownie, not a Kodak. It was a Davy Crockett camera. Yeah. And a Davy Crockett faceplate. And I wish I had that camera. Yeah. But uh, I've exhibited those pictures, a couple of them from when I was eight in, in shows. Actually, I had a 30 year retrospective at Haverford that <laughs> had one of my first pictures from when I was eight in it. We didn't collect that. No, no. we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good picture. So, what, so what, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just want, so we were just, I mean, you made me think about something that I haven't really thought about in a long, long time, but I've, I've always had this really fascination with experimental photography. I like, I like using scanners as, as photographies, photographer, uh, as a, as a camera. I like using, you know, soap boxes, anything as a camera. So I've always had this fascination with it. And I was just thinking like, where did that come from? And I do remember when I was a kid, I was really into blowing stuff up, I, I've always been, <laughs> but I was really into rockets. And you know, comic books. You know, you could get Estes rockets if yeah. you, you know the Estes rockets, like the model rockets. So I would get one of those. But there, there was the one that had the rocket camera. You remember that? Mm -hmm. So the way it would work is, and I'm going to geek out on this. So the the it, you would put the engine in backwards, the little power source, and it would pop the flash or the uh, it would pop the parachute out, and it had a little camera in it. Basically, it was a box camera, and it would trip a shutter. You know, so of course, you know, in the back of the magazine, it shows, you know, you're doing all these aerial photographies and your mom's waving out, you know, and all that, yeah. you know, but what you end up getting 95% of the time is just pictures of the sky, you know, there's, there's nothing there. But I was just amazed at that, you know, and, and the thing is, you know, you put the film in, you'd get one shot at this, you'd send it off, you'd have to wait two weeks and you get back and it's just a picture of a blue nothing just blue wow. and then i would do it again and send it <laughs> off and you know it's like i don't believe in that whole thing about you know like if you're what's the what's the phrase if you're you do more more than th three times and you're stupid or you're an idiot or something <laughs> that was me i did it multiple times and it never worked but i but i just it just really set me on a trajectory of just what can you do with making an image you know how can you make an image what can you use to make an image? Because you, you think about it, a camera is just a box with a hole in it. You could turn this whole room into a yep. camera. So it's just thinking about that idea and thinking about how light reflects off of services and how you can get that light to reflect. So yeah, so that's my thing. Cameras. Cameras. I was going to ask if anyone in the audience has a question. Um, thank you all for coming to the presentation. So we clearly live in a digital world. Um, so do you guys prefer to do film or do you dabble in a digital camera? Who? The big question. Well, actually, uh, whether you're wherever you are, you're in a you're in a digital world because um, that's just uh, it's it's really part of the digital revolution is that you have. Uh, you have command of being able to put your image into different modalities. And by modalities, I'm simply saying that there are different formats that your uh, image can migrate. To. Like you can put it on the internet. You can send it remotely to say one person as opposed to whoever's looking at your work on the internet. So that's the, the digital, uh, um, expression has revolutionized all sorts of communication, including fine art photography. And so it's, it's really not a matter of, you know, whether people use digital or not. If they're doing any kind of communication with photography, if they want their image to be in a magazine or they want it to be in a flyer, it has to be in digital format. So we're just there. Oh, you mean do I like you know which one? Which one do I like? Well, I use a film camera, and I also use a digital camera. So, all the photographs in here are uh, their origins was in film, but some of them are 
uh, carbon prints, which is another way of saying that the, they're ink prints and the inks you use are permanent. So they're digital. So now do I prefer digital prints or do I prefer silver gelatin prints? Well, it all depends on uh, how much time I have. Either way, it's just, you'll spend a lot of time and you'll spend a lot of money making a print. Exactly. I mean, that's one of the, the misnomers of all this is that photography is cheap. It's, it's, it's really not. Um, and I'd, I'd say that the thing that you have to want to think about is how you edit your work. The only problem, if you have a digital camera, you can take a gazillion pictures uh, without having really to think about what you're doing. If you only have 12 shots, <coughs> yeah, well, you have to. Yep. So you, it slows you down. So, uh, and the other thing is, is how you're looking at the world. If you have a digital camera, the thing that's seductive is that you want to see it right away. And actually looking at it in a flat field is, uh, is corrupting in terms of the experience, because the experience is that you're translating three-dimensional space into two-dimensional space. And so that's one of the hardest things, like if you're teaching students photography, is to get them to think three-dimensional and how, does, how will it look as a two-dimensional mm -hmm. thing. And um, as, as, as the world becomes more and more digital, you know, instantaneous, and also that it's not about light, it's about um, really digital is, is, is a zero, and x zero and x zero and x or you could say zero and one but it's 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 it's, it's by and so it's that polarity between yes and no that makes the image so it's it's all done it's done with a it's done um in code as opposed to if you're in film or you're in analog world then it's done by how much light is is really on a on a silver salt or a sil silver compound, and um, there is some difference between the two, um, and some some people say that they can tell the difference, but really, yeah, if you have a really great digital print or whatever, you can you can't tell the difference. So there, was not, time not you, anymore. there was a time you could, but now yeah. with the digital technology, I mean, it's, yeah. it's yeah, not can't. anymore. I mean, yeah. it's actually better than Kodachrome 64, which we used to be the standard. Yeah, so, so th I hope I didn't disappoint you by that answer. Well, <laughs> but, it's you thing, know, the thing I all think these is... photographers who use film, you ask them to see a picture of their dog, <laughs> and this is what they're going to show you. Yep. Yeah. It's my dog, Byron. <laughs> I think the, 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 the no. thing is, is what you want, what you want to do, what you want to see, you know. Um, the when I worked for the newspaper, uh, people would often ask, you know, what's the best camera? What kind of camera should I get? And our smart alecky remark is, you know, the best camera is the one you have with you. And I love this thing. I have it with me. And would I use it for some other projects that I was doing? Would I use it for dust-shaped hearts as, a, as the beginning source? No, because it's not the correct camera for it. Uh, but for what I'm, another project that I'm doing now, uh, this is ideal, you know, because I'm working on this, uh, this thing on the relationship between uh, earth and sky. And uh, sometimes I'm caught maybe putting gas in the tank and I look across and there's this beautiful relationship, you know, what's happening in the sky and what's happening on land. Hey, I got it. And sometimes I just want to say, you know, what if, what, what about that? What if, you know, it's easy to take what if, it doesn't cost a penny. Don't like it, immediately you don't like it. Hey, come back to it later on. This needs a light change. You know, it, it, it all depends to me. 
as to how you fit it into your life, how you learn to play with it. Well, we have a couple questions if we have time. So this is to everyone. Are there any contemporary photographers whose work interests you other than each other? Art <laughs> photography or documentary or artists working in all alternative lens based modes? Sure. Are there any contemporary photographers whose work interests you? Art photography or documentary or artists working in alternative lens based modes? I, I mean, I would say that the contemporary photographer, now this is on the photojournalism side, is a guy named Matt Black, who um, I think just does some amazing work. He's on Instagram. Um, and he's been doing this project where he's been documenting poverty in the country, but doing it in these big, gigantic loops. Um, it's just really amazing. Um, Lindsay Adario, who's another photographer um, for shoot, I'm not sure if you, is she shooting for Magnum, I guess, right? Or um, anyway, maybe yeah. She's, but anyway, she she's maybe just, been a war photographer. Yeah, she's a war photographer, and mm -hmm. she she's she's over there now. Uh, it's just just I mean. The woman just has amazing courage, just unbelievable. Um, so, I mean, those are two that I would, they just floated to the surface. There's tons more art photographers that I, that I, that I uh, uh, like. But, you know, arts, it, you know, I think the two, art and, and photojournalism, are, they're kind of oil and water in a way, <laughs> you know. Um, but, yeah, those are the two that floated in my head. Mendel, do you want to? Sure. Um, I mean, it's it's a tough one because there, it's you, you feel like as soon as you start to dive in, uh, you know you're going to leave a lot of names out. But you know there, I mean, it's the the names that sort of pop to my mind, and again, some of that is in the same way that Ron answered this, and the, the people that I sort of connect with are um, and. and that are a little bit younger than I am, but not all of them are people like um, Ruby Latoya Frazier and Deanna Lawson, Dina Lawson, and, um, you know, certainly of our another one of our contemporaries and another um, and two other um, Guggenheim fellows, African American Guggenheim fellows in particular um, are uh, Daoud Bay and and uh, Albert Chung are people that have a, they're more contemporary in the sense that they're our my contemporaries but not necessarily as young as I think this question may be you know directed towards but there are uh, huge numbers of uh, photographers I mean you know certainly right now people like Jess Dugan are doing kind of remarkable things and you know um, you know bringing am amazing work and uh, Lola Flash is getting remarkable um, you know, uh, recognition now for work that she has done for a long time, but still has, you know, no, nevertheless is a very uh, contemporary feel um, in her work. And um, I'll stop because I'm, you know, now starting to feel that sense of I'm leaving things, people out that I want to say. I'll throw in one Carrie May Wayne. Carrie May, yeah, absolutely. Her, you know. Honor Willie, you want to? Well, I'll answer that question. I put on my curatorial hat uh, and simply say I look at a lot of imagery. I look at contemporary, I look at his, when I say historical imagery, I mean 19th century photography. And then I look at, um, I look at 20th century, mid century photography. So I'm I consume, consuming a lot of images. And I'm always surprised by w whether it's contemporary, uh, historical, or mid-century, 20th century, what people have done, and there are a lot of people that I don't know uh, uh, about until I'm looking at the images, and I'm looking at them on a flat screen. So I, I subscribe to a number of Instagram, follow a lot of Instagram accounts, and uh, people are working in film, they're working digitally, uh, they're working serially, and they're also working in books. So 
I'm looking at all of that and I'm thinking like what should we have in a teaching collection like Haverford's? So that's why I won't be like Wendell or the rest of the, the, the guests here. So I say, I say somebody's name and they'll say, well, gee, why said my name? How come I'm not in the collection? <laughs> I'm going, so I'm going to, I'm going to stay, stay, stay clear name to just say I'm, I'm very aware. Uh, before the pandemic, I was even more aware because I was out, I was looking at images. Uh, but it's, 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 uh, it's a different, uh, it's just a different kind of thing that's happening now with the pandemic. Like, this is one of the most public exposed things that I've done in two years. Yeah. So I even not have my mask on right now. Um, and I would say if you come to the Berman, uh, you'll see some extraordinary work on the walls um, that are in, that are upstairs, that are downstairs, and that are part of the permanent collection. So I would, against what I'm telling you right now, I would say go to, museums and go to galleries and look at contemporary work and uh you'll you'll find something there that will appeal to you and this is like if you're really interested in photography this is the age of photography there are more people that are photographers than ever and yeah. in terms of, of of people that you didn't know about now that there's market value in images and states this work is coming out, literally coming out of uh, wherever it was, where it was hidden, it's coming out. And there is a, there is a chance to see it because again, uh, we're in a digital age. And so we're in a, we're in a profound, uh, probably uh, sense of, you know, how things get, how things get disseminated. That's what's really upsetting is that pretty soon um, it may be that uh, looking at things in books uh, may become more difficult than it is simply because you're really using so, much, so many resources to make paper, to do ink, to do all of that. It's, uh, it's, very, uh, it's very demanding on the environment. So. Did you want to? You know, it's. Um, I don't know whether it's a, an age thing, or I. You know, I've been I've been doing. Looking at photography for seventy plus years, um, and I, I've always looked at a lot of images, and I used to attach uh, names to them. Um, you know. I, you know, w. Eugene Smith is beautiful. Uh, you know, this is a, um, you know, um, the Carava picture, and, you know, this is a Cartier piece. And I used to memorize them and I could identify them like that. Uh, there's so much out there. And I, uh, you know, look through the, um, you know, I, through things that are coming up on screen. I look through the New York Times, and every now and then I'll see something that wow, this photographer is really, really strong. It's beautiful work. And I don't attach a name to it anymore. Um, and it might have just, it might just have something to do with where I am professionally, in, you know, in life. Not necessarily my career, but life. You know, I look at something beautiful, I look at a beautiful photograph, I look at a beautiful painting or whatever. And uh, to me, that's enough. I don't really need to attach a name to it anymore. Um, but that just might be a position where I am in life, not as an artist. Okay. <laughs> well, we're gonna... Director says wrap up, wrap, wrap up. up. <laughs> so, uh, sorry we didn't get the Shut last question online here, but um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you to the Berman and uh, for installing this beautiful show, quite beautiful. It looks extraordinary here. It's great work. And it's been my pleasure and 
People have known for a long time, and uh, say that. Yeah, you've known everybody for at yeah. least thirty years, and at least at you know, least we're talking. I'm glad so many of you have been here. Listen to a lot of wisdom. So thank you. Yeah.